Hi everyone, in this video we'll be talking about conventional bridges, when they're appropriate, the types of pontics and conventional bridges that we can prescribe, the materials used to fabricate these bridges and some complications that you should expect that might happen in the long run. So just before we get started, we'd like to thank Dr. Kushal Gardia, who is a consultant in restorative dentistry and a specialist in periodontology, prosthodontics, endodontics, restorative dentistry, and has a special interest in dental implantology. Dr. Gardia has been kind enough to provide this content from ACE courses, and while this video is just a summary, the full webinar is available to students completely free of charge on his ACE courses website. Sign up link in the description below. The first thing you want to be considering when treatment planning is the length of the span. You want to replace a gap which may have one or two teeth missing or in some rare cases, three teeth at the most. You also need to consider the positions of the missing teeth and whether they cross the midline or not. Other things to consider are the periodontal surface area of the abutment teeth, their endodontic status, if they're mobile, the quantity and quality of tooth structure remaining, if there are any restorations which are present, the patient's oral hygiene and periodontal status, their occlusion and whether they have a parafunctional habit, if there's enough occlusal clearance and the crown to root ratio. This is an example of a patient who presented with a sports-related injury. The upper right central and lateral incisor were of poor restorative prognosis and the upper left central incisor had an enamel dentine fracture. To do a conventional bridge in this case would be very destructive on the virgin upper left canine and the near virgin upper left central. Some better options in this particular case would be to do a cobalt chrome partial denture with an immediate acrylic denture, a resin retained bridge from the upper right canine to the upper left central, or two implants to replace the upper right incisors. In this particular case, the patient chose to go down the implant route, but you can achieve a similar aesthetic result with a resin bonded bridge if at a time of extraction you are able to achieve socket preservation and maintain good soft tissue and bone volume. It's clear that Apontic plays a huge role in improving the aesthetic outcome for the patient, but it's important to remember that it should also stabilize the occlusion and in turn be able to withstand occlusal forces while also stopping over eruption of the opposing tooth. It should also improve the masticatory function for the patient. The Pontic should be designed in such a way which means the area of the Pontic, the connector and the margin between the retainers and the abutment teeth are all cleansable. The first type of Pontic design we'll cover isn't really done anymore, but you might see in a patient with an old bridge and it's called a sanitary pontic design. There is a large amount of clearance from the ridge. This means that the patient can clean the area really easily and it serves the functional purpose of a conventional bridge. But the problem is that it has very poor aesthetics. If you ever needed to do this type of pontic, it's preferred to follow the contour of the ridge. The next design we'll talk about is called the dome-shaped pontic, where its tip sits on the crest of the ridge and the modified version of this is called the spheroidal shape where there is more contact onto the ridge. The design which is most commonly used is called the ridge lap or the modified ridge lap pontic. The advantage of these are that they're much more aesthetic and the difference between them is that the modified ridge lap, while easier to clean, gets more food impaction under the pontic, while the ridge lap is harder to clean but gets less food impaction on the palatal or lingual side. The last design we'll cover is called the saddle pontic, which covers more of the periodontal tissues and so is generally more difficult to clean and would require superfloss. Dr. Gardia says that he would generally prefer to use a spheroidal design. Before we move on to the next section, I'd really appreciate it if you guys gave this video a like and subscribe. It really helps our channel grow and reach more people. Thank you. Now we'll cover the different types of conventional bridges, starting with a fixed fix design, which utilizes rigid connectors at both ends of the pontics. This can replace one to two teeth and sometimes even three teeth spans, but it's important to note that the longer the span, the more stress and flexing that happens on the bridge, which increases the chances of failure. The abutment teeth for this design need to be parallel, which can also be difficult to achieve over a longer span and also increases the chance of pulpal exposure if the teeth aren't parallel. The abutment teeth also need to have similar retention and resistance form so that the forces can spread more evenly along the bridge. Generally, a fixed fixed is actually not the best option unless you're replacing a fixed fixed bridge already or unless the adjacent teeth are in need of cuspal coverage. That said, you shouldn't be using root treated teeth as an abutment. This is an example of a failing fixed fixed bridge which had marginal defects and secondary caries replacing the upper right first premolar. The upper right molar needed to be extracted. These are the pre-op clinical photos showing the marginal breakdown and you can also see a modified ridge lap design for the pontic. This is the post-op where the margins have been re-prepped and a new bridge has been made. 
It's important to remember that there is a one in six chance that the teeth may devitalize, in which case you would need to endodontically treat this tooth. As we've said before, you don't want to bridge a root treated tooth. So let's say the canine devitalizes. We would cantilever from the second premolar and crown the canine individually. Now instead, let's say the second premolar devitalized instead. Dr. Gardia doesn't like to do distal cantilevers. So in this case, he would leave the abutments as crowns and fill the space using a different method by placing an implant or a denture or alternatively accepting the gap. The next type of bridge we'll cover is called a fixed movable. And this is where you have one rigid connector and a movable connector on the other side, which allows vertical movements only. These are generally used for longer spans where the angulation of the teeth are not parallel and the preps would be very destructive. In this case, we introduce two different paths of insertion where we place the first part followed by the second part of the bridge locking into the first part. This is an example replacing the premolars and first molar where there is a male component on the right of the first molar and a female component on the left. So the left side would have to be cemented in first and then followed by the right side of the bridge where the patrix inserts into the matrix. Another type of bridge design would be the cantilever bridge where we only use one end of the pontic. This is generally good for anterior spaces and shouldn't really be done posteriorly because there are more forces placed on the pontic. We've spoken about this before, but there should never be any lateral excursive forces on pontics and there should only be a fairly light contact in ICP. The next type of bridge design is a spring cantilever where the adjacent teeth are not suitable as abutment teeth and so we need to use a tooth at a different site and these are really done. Other designs include hybrid designs where you would use a combination of a conventional prep on one side and a resin bonded retainer on the other side of the pontic. Removable bridges can be removed to clean underneath and implant supported bridges can also be done. In terms of materials, Dr. Gardia massively prefers to use PFM. Where you extend the porcelain up to can depend on the opposing arch and if the person is a bruxist, for example. Metal margins are also preferred if it's not in an aesthetic zone because they're so much easier to clean. For full porcelain bridges, there needs to be more long-term studies to evaluate the outcome, but this is an option and it would be more conservative than a PFM. Gold can be used, but only in unesthetic areas and is also more expensive. In terms of looting agents, you can use any of the following on the screen now, but also bear in mind that zinc oxide eugenol is only used as a temporary cement. There can be complications with constructing bridges. We've already mentioned that one in six teeth can devitalize. You also need to be mindful of periodontal membrane space widening and bone loss due to unfavorable loading. And from a restorative standpoint, these abutments are prone to secondary caries, decementation, and increased chances of fracturing due to the increased loads. Okay guys, we hope you found that video useful. And if you did, we would really appreciate it if you gave this video a like and subscribe to our channel. There are more videos like this coming soon in line with the ACE Courses webinars created by Dr. Gardia. For the full webinar, make sure you check out the ACE Courses website, which is completely free of charge for students to use and contains some really interesting cases, which for time purposes, we couldn't include in this video. There's a link in the description to sign up if you haven't done so already. And we'll see you in the next video, guys. Thank you. Thanks.